A very good morning to everyone and welcome to the Community Chess Leadership Academy and Training Institute's final training program for the year. My name is Taryn Bell and it gives me an honor to introduce such a critical conversation today as we commemorate the 16 days of activism. Women in, women in leadership and the resilience in times of crisis. I will start the, the session today by outlining the form of the, of the webinar. We, um, I'll do the introduction of our host. We'll start the conversation by Dr. Claire Kelly. We will then give the last 20 minutes of the conversation. We'll, we'll give the audience an opportunity to ask some questions and give our panelists time to respond. We are really excited about, about today um, and also really quite nervous <laughs> about the subject matter. I think it's, it's a pertinent conversation that commemorates the 16 days of activism. I think I want to start by saying that the community chest position on the issue of gender-based violence and activism against violence of women and children is unwavering a 365 days approach. It's what this pandemic demands. We, 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 we outline this by speaking about our investments in gender empowerment programs that speaks to the entire ecosystem of, of, of a woman. This includes the boy, child and the father. Our investments is particularly through our strategic grant making practice that strengthens causes, campaigns and projects that not only raises awareness around the serious plight in our country currently, but projects and programs and solutions that looks at systemic issues that has birthed this pathology. We believe that women need not only to be supported and strengthened, but they too need to be celebrated as that of victorious and resilient. COVID-19 has sorely highlighted this. Today on this webinar, we commemorate some of the women in our country, in our city, women in leadership that have shown significant resilience. We will continue to fight every day for every year until the brutality against women and children in this country is restored, until every woman and child is safe and protected in our lifetime. Today, I am joined by pioneers in the space that find themselves in very different facets. All three of these panelists are ordinary women from the Cape Flats and townships in our country who is doing extraordinary work in the spaces they find themselves in. I'm going to leave the introductions to Dr. Claire Kelly, who will give you further, a further synopsis on who they are. I'm really fortunate today to be joined by them, some of them who I've actually sat at the feet of, and then our very own chairperson, Ms. Charlene Duncan, who joins us today as a dynamic feature in this conversation. Dr. Claire Kelly, our host, who is no stranger to the community chest, who is really leading, um, who leads spaces and conversations around equality, white privilege and transformation. Dr. Claire Kelly currently is the Program Manager for Transformation at the Stellenbosch University of South Africa, where she serves as the Head of Transformation. This was since 2019 to October. Prior to this, she was the HOD at the Cornerstone Institute, a big partner of the Community Chest, and she headed up the Sociology and Community Development Faculty. She holds a PhD in Psychology from the University of Cape Town, which focused on racial identity, post-apartheid activism, and holds an MPhil in Diversity Studies, which focuses on whiteness and masculinity. also from UCT. She has a long-standing interest and is very passionate about diversity and identity, moreover social change, having managed to contribute to research projects in diversity, inclusion, and transformation of organizations, racial transformation in small towns. Her current interest, where we've currently find Claire, is in transformation of the higher learning sector, with a particular interest in the emancipatory role of the university and what this means for functioning universities at various levels. Moreover, 
She's married and has two beautiful children. Won't you help me welcome Dr. Kay Kelly to the podium. <laughs> thank you, Taryn, for that very warm welcome. And thank you for asking me to facilitate this conversation. I, like yourself, am very honored to be in the presence of, of such great women, such great leaders. Um, and so just some opening thoughts for myself, just before I introduce the, the, our panelists today, just to say that, that women, and my use of the word here is inclusive, referring to cis and gender queer women, are often at the forefront of efforts for social change and social justice. We need only look back in our history for examples of leading from, uh, only need, we look, need only look back in our history uh, for example, of women leading social change, whether it be from the front of a protest march, from inside a corporate boardroom, or from a kitchen. Um, we also need only look back in our history to realize that these women have led um, in the face of prejudice, oppression, and the violence of patriarchy. These women, and all women currently, still lead in spite of our position um, in society rather than because of it. So today we sit at the feet of three leaders, uh, women who lead efforts for social change and justice in their respective areas of expertise. We will hear their stories, we will learn from their experiences and insights, and we will hear them reflect on the resilience that they have to show in navigating what remains fairly hostile territory, especially for women of color. So, the first of our leaders that we will hear from is Professor Nadine Bowers Tsui. I am very fortunate to call Professor Bowers Tsui a colleague of mine um, at Stanford. She is currently an associate professor in theology and development in the Faculty of Theology at Stellenbosch University. The majority of her research has focused on the intersection between religion and development, and her most recent project is entitled, Does Faith Matter? Exploring the role of faith-based organizations as civil society role play. She serves on the board of two MPOs and is the director of the Unit for Religious and Development Research. She sees herself as an activist academic, and I have seen her as an activist academic also, if that counts for anything. <laughs> Always seeking to push for space for more voices to be heard. She is married to Andres, and they have a beautiful 10-year-old daughter, Daniela. So first, we'll be hearing from Professor Nadine Bowles Toy, and then we'll be hearing from Ms. Charlene Duncan, who I'm sure needs no introduction in this forum. Um, Charlene is the Director for the Center of Entrepreneurship and Innovation, also known as the CEI, at the University of the Western Cape, and serves as the Chairperson of the Board of Community Chess of the Western Cape. The CEI is active in developing short courses and entrepreneurship training programs at UWC and has a footprint across all seven faculties. Its objectives are addressing student entrepreneurship and contributing to local economic development by supporting SMMEs in the Western Cape. Charlene is also the co-convener of the Community of Practice, the Entrepreneurial University for the national platform Entrepreneurial Development in Higher Education which reports into USAF, which is University of South Africa. Finally, we will hear from Ms. Zandila Siwali. Zandila is the director of Etafeni Day Care Center Trust. She has a great passion and heart for development and empowering people. She believes that communities can best be served through ethical leadership and strong organizational structures where the shared vision is clear. She has over 15 years experience in the nonprofit sector, and this has included administration, project management, and staff recruitment. She has a BCom majoring in industrial psychology from the University of the Western Cape, and has also been involved in church leadership with her husband of many years, Oscar. Zandi and Oscar also have three sons. So these are the illustrious women that we will be sharing our morning with. Just to remind you of the, the structure of the day, in the first part of the session, we'll hear from each one of the speakers individually. They'll then enter into conversation with each other. Um, 
please do post your questions both on Facebook and on the Zoom um, chat throughout the conversation. We will collect these um, and present them to our speakers in the final Q&A session in the last part of the session, of the whole session. But I think that's enough for me. And I think without further ado, um, let's hear from our first panelist, Professor Nadine Bowers-Petroy, welcome. Thanks so much, Claire, and um, good morning to everybody. Uh, Claire, some, Claire is definitely um, a fellow comrade at Stella Bosch University. Uh, and once upon a time, many, many years ago, I taught uh, Taryn, so I feel very, very uh, much at home, and it's, it's really wonderful. Um, and I think it's important to say that um, academics like myself are enormously um, privileged. Uh, so I don't want to be coming from a position of saying, oh, you know, shame for academics. I think we're just going to talk about our experiences in our different um, spaces. And all our experiences are not the same. So you talk to me and you talk to another female academic of color and your experience might be uh, slightly uh, different. But I want to say I speak as a woman of color who holds a leadership position in my own faculty um, and then also in my field, um, nationally and internationally. So having said all of that, people of color and more especially women of color, now I know these terms, I could say I'm Vika Black, other people may say no, so stick with me here. Yeah, those are the terms that I'm, I'm using for today. But we're severely underrepresented um, in the sector, both in terms of leadership and in terms of seniority within the professorships. So I'm really excited to see someone like Prof. Bakeng from UCT and the newly appointed Prof. Puleng uh, Lenkabula um, at UNISA um, actually stepping into key leadership positions at the rectorate and vice uh, chancellor level, which is the highest that you could uh, level you could attain at a university. Um, but for the most part, um, universities and historically white universities, for example, uh, despite the fact that they're targeting um, in terms of diversity, in terms of affirmative action, which I would talk about as quantitative transformation, so the numbers game, which is very important. University spaces are still, and Claire will affirm this, are still notoriously untransformed spaces. Academia was never built for women or people of color, and more especially not for women of color. And across the world, these spaces are known to be patriarchal, hierarchical, and they are racist in origin and sometimes in terms of uh, functioning. Um, in historically white universities, the system was created to serve and perpetuate normative white patriarchy. So in other words, it wasn't created for us. So when you enter that space, the message is often, um, this space wasn't created for you, you're a guest here and, you know, just, just make, your own, make your own space. Um, in my own faculty, which I would say, and Claire, I think would confirm this, which is one of the more, in terms of quantitative transformation, transformed faculties within the university, we only appointed our first full female professor of color uh, last year. I'm an associate professor, we like to joke, and as professor, <laughs> associate professor, and so in many ways, women of color who are taking up leadership positions in this particular sector, we are doing what the Spanish proverb says, we are making the path by walking it. And <clears throat> the majority of us, if not all of us, are actually first generation university uh, graduates. So my resistance to the whole notion of you are a guest in this space, um, is to claim the space as my own. And I think we're gonna talk a little bit about um, resilience later, but one of the things that I've done is to say, I claim this space, this is, this is my space. And I've sometimes been asked, why do you look so at home in this space? Now, sometimes the answer for why, uh, particularly women of color look at home in this space is because they've had to assimilate. They've had to begin to perform um, whiteness, they've had to begin to perform in patriarchal spaces. Um, and so our resistance to this, I think for many of us, is to claiming our space, claiming our human dignity, 
knowing who we are, knowing the value uh, that we bring, and actually saying, well, in a dehumanizing system that was not created for us, uh, we claim our space and we also make space for others that come behind us and for our students. Recently, I was chatting to a fellow um, a colleague, also a woman of color, and we were it was actually just in this week. And we were talking about that not only are you breaking that uh, proverbial you know, glass ceiling that's there, but you literally need to be what we joked, we said you literally need to be um, the second coming uh, to actually be recognized within such spaces. While white mediocrity is often much more easily uh, rewarded, you know, and so you can have quantitative transformation, you can have numbers, but if the system is not challenged in terms of being transformed, then the status quo um, will not change. I think also for many of us, uh, myself included, I'm not ashamed of saying that I was an affirmative action appointment. I'm not ashamed of that. And, and why is it that I'm not ashamed of that? Well, because at the time I knew that both my scholarship was on the level <clears throat> and the person that I was and the experience that I brought was what my university and what my faculty needed. And so I didn't spend a lot of time trying to prove that I'm here because that's often the feeling that one has, you know, you're entering the space as a gift, as a, as a, as a token, um, as a guest, and now you have to prove your worth, that you are not this token. So for me, I decided I'm not going to spend my time um, trying to prove that I am worthy of the system. I believe that I am. I believe that this is where I'm supposed to be. I knew that I had the qualifications to be appointed at that level. And I would rather spend my time challenging the broader system that actually created these inequalities um, in the first place. The other thing that myself and this colleague was chatting about was that when you reach a certain level of seniority in the system, um, the burden is often on people of color, and I often, it's, it's women of color, that will constantly challenge notions of racism and sexism and exclusion in any form that you see it. And, and you know, this is tiring. This is an everyday in a way. Um, but I think it's one of those things that we do because we know that not only do our lives depend, depend on it, if we don't challenge these systems, if we don't call things out, and it's hard to call things out. I think there's the stigma of the angry, angry black woman in many sectors. I, I'm also okay with that because I believe our lives depend on it and the lives of our students, uh, many of whom are first generation students like we once were, uh, depend um, on it too. I've also seen and observed that often it's women of color, just like women in communities the world over, women of color within university spaces from junior colleagues, in other words, colleagues entering at um, junior lecturer, you know, we have this hierarchical system, you go junior lecturer, lecturer, senior lecturer, social professor, professor, um, but it's women at all levels, um, my sisters actually in the spaces that are the ones that are speaking up for students, that the one that are, that are bearing um, the decolonizing agenda, if you will, at universities, that are the ones that are advocating um, for students and particularly students of color. So I think there's many, many challenges um, that we face and that's what we're supposed to speak about our experience in the specific um, area in which we work, and I could talk about this forever, um, but I think that it's time now to give over to my other panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much, Nadine. And um, yeah, <laughs> we, we, uh, I, yeah, we, 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 uh, I think that experience certainly resonates with, with myself. Um, yeah, so moving on to our next um, panelist, to, to Charlene, also working in a university context, but slightly different, I would say. So Charlene, um, over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Claire. Um, just maybe before I start speaking, just to say that I've only been working in academia for the past six and a half years. Prior to that, I have worked um, in corporate and I've worked in government. And so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today and a lot of the experiences that I'm going to be um, extracting my information on is going to be based on um, my experiences within corporate South Africa. So I worked at the Medical Research Council um, where I was an executive uh, manager at the age of 28 and I was the first and the youngest um, woman in, in that environment. Uh, from there, I was headhunted for, uh, to go and work at APSA, where again, I was the first black and the youngest um, woman in the boardroom looking after um, the Eastern and, and, and the Western Cape uh, for a very big area in terms of APSA. And so a lot of what I want to talk to you about today is about my experience as a young black woman um, and how many of that in the past 15 years, uh, very little has changed. But the value that I hope to share, um, the, the story that I'd like to share is to empower women who are listening today, who may have similar challenges and who may need some hand holding, because I really believe that as women, we don't do a good enough job about supporting each other, holding each other's hands and, and helping each other to navigate um, difficult spaces. I didn't want to talk statistics, but um, when I was thinking about what I was going to say today, I remember reading an article about a year ago, um, and the article spoke about 22% of board directors of listed companies in South Africa are women, um, and less than 10% of, of women are executive directors. And I know in the sector that I'm currently in, and I speak under correction, but I think there are about four or five out of 26 universities uh, who have female vice chancellors. And when you think of 26 years into our democracy, um, the kind of constitution that we have in this country, it's quite shocking when you reflect and, 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 and you look at that. And so I think that in some sectors and in some environments, there's been a, a mindful and a conscious shift. Um, and, and it is getting better, but I think that we need to recognize and we need to realize that there's still very many unpleasant realities. So if I were to share very briefly in about the eight minutes that I have left in terms of, of what some of those challenges were and how I embraced um, and navigated those spaces, I'd like to say that as women, we have to recognize and we have to be honest with ourselves that these challenges do exist. Have a plan. Um, you know, I think women are great. Um, and when we speak about resilience, I'm hoping to speak more about the kinds of plans we need to be resilient. But I think have a plan. Be clear in your head about how you're going to be um, tackling the space that you're in. One of the things that I found to be um, quite important for me was that I needed to know what my strengths are, needing to believe in who I am, needing to, to shift away from this token mindset and knowing that as a woman, I have something to offer. Um, because of the skill set that I have, I have something to offer. And so just embracing your strengths as a woman becomes an, a very important um, strategic component. Very often as a woman, I'm often asked, um, I wasn't introduced as a mom, um, but I am a mom of three kids. And um, for, the, for the first part of my, of my life, I was a single mom for almost six years. And often people ask me, how do I balance my life, home, work? And, and very quickly, I got to learn that it's not about balancing, but it's about a blend. And, and how you blend those two areas of your life becomes very important. And again, that's a very individual kind of approach and an individual kind of, you know, it's a, there, there are many factors that this is dependent on. But I really felt that it helped me thinking about it as a blend rather than a balance. And then something that's very important to me is to own your voice. Um, you can add value, respect yourself. I often used to say that I don't ever want to look at myself in the mirror and wonder where I went wrong. And maybe to give you a practical example of owning my voice and of, of standing up and, and saying, you know what, this doesn't work for me. Um, as a single mom of two very young children at the time, it was impossible for me to get to the office from the southern suburbs into the city at seven o'clock in the morning to have a meeting. Practically, that meant having to leave my two kids under the age of five at a daycare center at six o'clock in the morning. And because I was the only woman, I needed to own my voice and I needed to say this arrangement doesn't work for me. 
Um, and we really need to think about how we do things differently. And I'm sure that we can relate to many other practices or institutional barriers that almost allow, almost prevents women from becoming active participants. And so how do you own your voice? And how do you tackle those institutional barriers, playing golf or having drinks after work, or the kind of really impractical things that, that just prevents women from participating. And I think another big um, area for me, which is, which is something that is very close to my value system, is around being authentic. Um, be yourself, understand yourself, know yourself. Um, it, it links to, 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 to being um, part of owning your voice. I am very privileged for the last two years to have had a business coach who practices the nursery, uh, Nancy Klein's thinking environment and where being authentic is a very big uh, and important part of that. And it's part of why I believe that women make great leaders because many of those skills are innate. Many of those skills are part of our DNA. And it's about how we understand um, the space that, that, that men work in. I often say that you know men use data. And yes, we need to use data as women, but we have additional soft skills like intuition um, and 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 some of those things just come naturally to us. And so how do we enhance and how do we use those skills holistically becomes very really important. I don't think I would have been able to do many of the things that I've been able to do um, if I didn't have a support network and a support structure. And again, that support network and that support structure can take many different forms, but recognizing that, that we need that so that we can get that blend right, so that we can grow as individuals, so that we can understand the value of the skill set and the contributions that we make um, becomes very important. Um, I, I, I was an executive, as I said, um, at the age of, of 28. And at that time, there were many things that I didn't know. And I was sometimes offended. I, I sometimes didn't quite know when I felt like I was being spoken down to. I mean, I was called Chalinki um, or, 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 or when I was um, discriminated against. How do you, how do you not get caught up in that? And how do you manage um, you know, moving on from um, from all of that. And so, yeah, you know, I, I quickly had to learn some of those those boardroom skills. Um, I'm going to stop there now. I, I think I've tried to just give you some broad strokes about, but how do you survive and how do you cope? And what are the things that you need to to talk to yourself about and through to be able to, to navigate the space successfully? Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much, Charlene. And... Um... I think we're already seeing kind of common threads in the stories that both yourself and, and Nadine are sharing with us. And I, it's certainly resonating very, very deeply with me. Um, so we move on to our final panelist, Zandile. Um, welcome and the floor is yours. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Claire. And um, to... Uh, my former panelists, Nadine and Shalene, thank you so much. Um, I just want to know if everyone can hear me clearly before I can go on. You're perfect. We can hear you. Perfect. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. I think I went first before I move on to just introduce myself a little bit and tell you of my own experience and how I grew up. Um, as, as, a, as a woman and as a mother. Um, I was one of those black women that was raised by their grandmother and, and, and my mother. And um, my grandmother was a domestic worker um, um, who held the whole family together, who took care of um, her own five children. Um, and then uh, my mother was the eldest of the of the of the girls and my mother had to stop studying and go and work because um she had to to go and help my grandmother in taking care of the whole family and at that time my, uh, there were also nephews and nieces my 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 aunts had children so the whole family was taken care of by these two strong women that i I, I, I was raised by. And um, what I've learned from that is that they were able to adapt 
uh, to the changes and the transitions of life, especially at that time with uh, in the time of appetite and everything that was happening at the time. And, and they were able to create values uh, that um, um, continued to upheld us as as the family and as and as 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 yes and as and as the society. They created a path for us so that we can be able to move through. So um, that's the kind of a background that probably has shaped and moved me slowly to get to where I ended up, which is in the nonprofit sector, which I love, love so much um, every day. Um, I have worked with a different organizations like Rape Crisis Cape Town. I've worked for Quaker Peace Center for a short while. I've worked for a Connect Network. And uh, what was so fortunate for me uh, was that uh, most of these organizations that I've worked for were led by women and um, who later became uh, my sort of my, my role models and I have been able to learn a lot from them. And um, what I have learned as um, a woman in, in leadership is that um, there is a, women are gradually making their leadership presence in the different spheres of the society, like administration, education, as we have just had. So women are constantly evolving and reaching new milestones with, um, with a, a wide spectrum of human activities. And in my own experience, as a, as a leader and as a woman, is that women leaders are more transformational and we function as role models, especially to our sub, sub, subordinates. Uh, we inspire the team and spend a lot of time uh, coaching our teams that we are leading. We, we care a lot about personal development of the people that we're leading. Uh, women leaders emphasize uh, teamwork, uh, specifically for me, I'm a very inclusive leader that I would want to make sure that all the people that I'm leading, they are able to follow and know where, um, where we are going. Um, and and uh, so for most women leaders, leaders um, have not really only meant for accomplishing the organizational goals, but in transforming the followers into better people and passionate about changing the environment and make changes within the society. I just want to make an example of um, my day yesterday and my day yesterday has taught me so many things as I was trying to juggle so many things, so many balls that were on my table at work. Yesterday we had a full day. Yesterday was the we were starting our 16 days of activism, and we felt that we needed to have a a training or a workshop for all of our staff members and taking them through uh, the gender-based violence training. And we started the day with that. And then immediately after that, we planned that we are going to march. Um, I, I, think I've, I think when I was introduced earlier, I'm working for Etafeni Daycare Center Trust and Etafeni is in Nyanga. And we were marching uh, in Nyanga to start the 16 days of activism with our beneficiaries and the Nyanga communities. And what I have experienced as a, as, as a woman and as a leader, sing, seeing women singing and seeing women dancing in the streets of Nyanga and continuing to pass the message of gender-based of gender violence and work for, for, for and, and working towards a change in the society. And immediately, after after that event we needed to come back to the center because we had we have an ECD program that we're running and we have had an organization that has given us some nice gifts for our children and we, we then came back and we were giving out all of these gifts to all of to all of our children we have about 99 kids in our ECD and we have about 40 kids in our after school program and running from that into the board meeting that I was supposed to be attending in the evening. And all of those kind of things are showing um, the, the, the power that 
um, women possess and the, and the fact that we are able to juggle all of these different roles and all of those kind of things and being able to work with the different types and different kinds of women, um, whether it is in the community or the women that you are serving, which is your beneficiaries, or sitting in a higher uh, um, seat of a board meeting and then being able to talk strategically about the organization and what was happening. So that day for me was um, one day that probably when I think of what we are talking about today would probably represent the kind, um, the woman and that the kind of woman that we are and how, uh, how we are able to multitask um, uh, as women. And um, so uh, with the, with the, I think we're going to talk later about the resilience and especially around the COVID-19 and everything else that we have gone through. I would like to share more around that, especially as an organization uh, that is working in the community. Um, I think in my other experience has also been as a leader, especially in the space of religion, because I think um, in my introduction, you now know that my husband is a pastor. And there are some of the things where you would want your voice to be heard. And, and um, in the church sector, that has become um, very difficult where you needed to have uh, to open some of the doors, but you, you, you probably need your husband more to be able to open that door for you so that your voice can actually be heard. So um, that's the experience that I've had, that I have, I have ex that's my experience as a woman, especially in the in the church sector um, it has not been very very easy for you as a woman to just stand up and being able to um, to relay a message and, and it doesn't matter how big or how small that message is but the fact that you you are seen as a a secondary or I don't want to say a lesser but a secondary kind of um, a, a, a person because uh, the understanding in that um, in, in that in that space is that men um, have more voice I also have been experiencing say the same thing especially as a uh, in the black society in like Nyanga that I'm working in as a person because of culture and all of those kind of things and when I I came in as a director of ETAF and all I wanted was to make sure that there is networking amongst the community structures and also we are able to form some partnerships around and I have had so many um, uh, so many uh, doors that have not been comfortably opened because I I am now a woman and I wanted to sit around uh, with community structures and be able to talk about what is happening in the area that uh, that we are that we are that we are working in. So those kind of things have continue to be the struggles that we as women um, um, that we as women are going through so so there are certain spaces that we as women leaders that we know for sure that it's going to be difficult to penetrate and being able to get in and making sure that your voice um, your voice is is heard um, so I think um, for me, um, I, I'm, I'm also not going to take long. I think the one thing that I want to say is, la is, is that without just taking more of your time, um, by the way, I am a preacher more than I am probably a director. So I talk a lot and when I'm given a chance to be able to talk. So, um, so I, I'm glad that someone is, is, has, um, is timing us. Oh, I have two minutes left. So with my two minutes that is, that is left, I just want to say that um, with all of the challenges that we as women have encountered and, uh, as women leaders, women-headed organization, we continue to achieve the desired results and impact in our communities. Women leaders continue to struggle for their space in leadership positions and the deserved respect they have earned in the community they work in.
and closing i think basically the development sector is primarily is primarily i believe strongly that is primarily powered by the labor the vision and the creativity of women thank you so much Thank you very much, Sandy. I see the theologians are in the house. <laughs> um, thank you to all three our panelists. I think we have a lot to, to think about and, and to chew on. Um, we'll be going into the discussion now, the conversation. And I thought what I might do is just, as you've spoken, I picked up certain threads. Um, and so I'm going to throw these threads into the mix and we can speak to them or not, depending on, on how the conversation goes. But a thread that's come up is this idea of knowing your own value um, and understanding that you have value even if your environment is telling you possibly that, sorry, <laughs> it's the timer, Randy, that was your time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and, value. and I know as a woman myself, um, and even as a white woman, uh, there's a, a lot of self-doubt creeps in. Um, and I was, mm. I'm interested in, in how you sustain that knowing of your value in a context that is telling you that you are a second-class second citizen, like Randy has just talked about. I mean, relating to that, this idea of owning your voice in an environment which is not necessarily welcoming of that voice. Um, there's an amount of, there's a strength of conviction and courage that comes with owning your voice, claiming the space, right? And I'm interested in, in, in how one sustains that kind of conviction and courage um, as, as you move into those spaces. And I think this links to the idea of support structure, Charlene, you talked about support structures. And I'd really be interested in us kind of extrapolating on support structures. You know, what do they look like? What do they need to look like? Um, relating to that, the role of male allies, and, and Zandi, you mentioned your, your husband as someone who has facilitated your leadership in the church. Um, and we know that we need allies, male allies in these environments. You know, what, what is their role, um, if any? <laughs> um, what, what is their role? In, 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 in advancing the position of women in, in leadership. And then I suppose as a last thought, what also struck me in what you were saying is that, and we know this, that the, the burden of transformation or social change within certain spaces, whether it be, whether it be a university, whether it be in a community context, whether it be in a church or boardroom, very often falls to women of color. It's not enough for us to just be a great theologian or a great pastor or a great um, chairperson of, 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 of a board. We also have to be people who are change agents and advocates. And I'm, I'm wondering about the burden of that um, and, and how that, plays into this idea of, of resilience. And so those are my thoughts. Um, but I think let's open up the conversation and um, take it from there around the theme of resilience. Thank, thanks, Claire. Maybe if, if, if I can just pick up because um, something that I've been thinking about quite a lot, and that is just around um, the role that men play. And, um, you know, linking that to sports structures and linking it to my own experience in, in my case. Um, and even now, I've always been very fortunate to have a male HOD that has supported me and that has given me the space to grow. And so I think for me, I often say that there are times where men need, we need men to be in the forefront of this battle. Um, we need to create spaces for the voices of men on panels like this. And the reason I'm saying that is that um, they need men who understand the value that women bring sometimes can be the voice, the missing voice. And so as long as women's worth is undervalued in society, both culturally, socially, 
the longest, as long as there are certain things that are seen to be a woman's job, simply because there's a perception that it has less of value, we are constantly going to have these conversations. I think we must also acknowledge the, um, the strength that patriarchy and power has. And so how do we kind of start breaking down those kinds of powers? And I believe that's the role that men can play. I mean, I think men are very important in terms of our support structure, as a support structure as well. Um, you know, we, I recently completed a master's as an example, and I would not have been able to do that if I didn't ever have a husband who could cook and pick up children at school and be there to stand in the gap. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think that, that that's an important part. I'm going to say one other thing because I want to allow other people to speak and I've got a lot of things to say about this. But I think the, the, the other thing that, that, that's important, um, and I'm going to stick to support structures, I'll, I'd like to pick up on the owning my own voice, but I can always pitch in if nobody else picks up on that. But the other thing that I, I also want to say is that we as women, especially women um, in leadership, we need to support each other. I, I, and, and I say this, I often say uh, to people on, on a public forum, I say, I understand um, the abusive roles that men can play in our, in our lives. And I've been there, I've had that experience. But in my own journey, it's my fellow women who have often um, treated me far, far um, worse. Um, you know, I remember being very excited about being point, appointed on an executive management council where there was one other woman who was about 20 years older than me. And I really believed that she would embrace me, take me under her wings, teach me the ropes. And she was the one person amongst the 12 or 14 other men who constantly stabbed me in the back all of the time. And so the one thing that I want women to take away from a conversation talking about support structure and resilience is that we need to support each other. We need each other. And it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard lesson that I've had to endure. And it's something that I'd like to encourage other women um, to go on. I'm going to stop and I'll pitch in if there's space for more comments. Mm -hmm. Nadine, I see your hand is up literally. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so I just want to touch, start with that whole sisterhood um, thing. Cause it's something that I talked about as I wanted to talk about as well. Um, you know, the solidarity of sisterhood and even just us having this conversation now, I feel that already. Mm -hmm. um, and that sisters of all color, shape, sizes, uh, you know, whatever. It's wonderful. One of my colleagues is on at the moment and she sent the message to say, um, Professor Julie Carson to say, hey, I'm watching, watching you go, go. Um, but, you know, it's a lot more than that. I mean, we laugh, we comfort each other and we strategize and we caucus. So let's talk about caucusing. I mean, Shirley, you were talking about the whole notion of how to navigate the space and about um, a power in spaces. Um, and so caucusing is a key part of that. Even when it comes down to the thing of, um, you know, one of you spoke about your children and needing to go to meetings, you know, those after school old boys, uh, brides and things like that. Um, and in our faculty, we have very strong women and the tradition used to be that we had like a, a once a term um, sort of gathering, eating, brying or whatever. And it was usually only started at five o'clock. And so some of us as women said, single women and married women with children said, listen, this is too late for us. We don't live in Stellenbosch like the old boys club used to do. Um, we have kids and homes uh, to get home to. And it's unsafe uh, for some of the single women who live further out to, to drive at night. So sorry, you need to change the time. And they did. Um, you know, so, but I think the caucusing, and that's a very simple thing. There's lots of other more complex justice issues that we caucus around. But I think caucusing shouldn't be a swear word for women. And when we caucus, we also caucus with our brothers, um, you know, that, that buy into the same agendas that we do. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is with regards to taking up space um, <clears throat> is that, you know, we talk about having a space at the table, right? Sometimes you have to bring your own cutlery. And my mother's taught me, bring your own cutlery and your own chair if needed and make that space and claim that space. You don't always have to ask for it or beg for it. 
People may not like it. They might see you as an unwanted guest, but they'll soon see that your place at the table and your voice and space at the table um, adds value ultimately at the end of the day. Um, and then I think more importantly, once you're in that space, make space for others and bring cutlery for them if they, if they don't have their own. So, you know, I think for me, that whole thing of eating women in power, anybody in power, it's easy for us when we sit at tables to just eat for ourselves and get fat once we've gotten those positions and establish our, our strength and our position um, at that table. Um, but my mother is only, my mother is a, is a, a pastor's wife and today a, a national and an international church leader. And she taught me this. She said, no, bring your own cutlery. They'll soon see who you are. Um, so yeah, that's all I'll say for now. You're muted, Zandi. Yes, I think for me, I, I, I want to, to echo what Shalene has been saying in terms of, of um, having um, some men in your sphere so, uh, to be able to use them to be not not in a, yeah, to, to be your allies. That's the word that she used, uh, to be your allies. And I think I've learned that sooner or later that um, in the different parts of um, the community and the different parts of the organization and the different levels of the organization, I always have to have someone who is a male that would probably be able to open the door and then when they see his face then everyone becomes comfortable and then you just walk in and be able to do your thing and then the other thing that i've learned is that when men show respect to you as a woman then other men are able to respect you as well so um and, and how those allies um, treat how those allies treat you or, 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 or handle or whatever. Um, I don't know the English word, but I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Um, it makes room then for you to be able to, uh, to, to come across and, be, and being able to, to um, and being able to, to, to continue to do whatever that um, that you that you're supposed to do and that you were there to do. So I think um, that's what I have learned um, coming from um, the nonprofit sector, especially in the communities, because it's difficult in the communities to be a woman that leads men and women, and that has to interact almost every day with with the. The, the different cultural values and, and, and all of those kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Charlene. Thank, thanks, Claire. I maybe want to pick up on the question that you asked around value and, um, you know, about owning, owning your voice. And I want to say that that is very difficult. It's, it's not something that comes naturally. I mean, I, I, I consider myself to be an old hand um, at leadership, but I am still struggling with certain things today. So I want to say that no matter how long, and that's because of those norms that I spoke about and that societal pressure and patriarchy and power, mm. um, it doesn't matter. I often say I, I can handle boardroom politics because I've been schooled in boardroom politics. But it doesn't mean that after a tough day when I walk out of that boardroom that I'm not having to deal with or that I'm still hesitant. Um, and, and, and so I want to just share some practical thoughts around that. And some of it could be controversial but those are things that are, that have helped me I, I think i've learned about the importance of a network and i think nadine spoke quite a bit about um the caucus component um you know the pitching up with your own cutlery and your own chair and that's that's really important so and and you learn that and you have those skills if you've got a support structure in terms of a network, in terms of friends, sisterhood, in terms of your husband, your parents. I mean, my mom and dad play an integral part in, in, in my support structure. Um, my dad's worked in corporate for 40 odd years. And I will still ask him, um, you know, what do you think about this? How do you think I should navigate that? And so I think that's something as women that, that, that we really need to embrace. I spoke a bit about our intuition, but I want to say that intuition, that sixth sense that we have, 
learn how to trust your gut. Don't make assumptions. Don't jump to conclusions, which are sometimes some of the labels that they do like to give to us. But with data, with facts, um, uh, through authenticity, use your trust. Learn how to trust your gut. And again, that's a skill. Um, one of the things that's really, really helped me is a business coach or, or, or a mentor. You know, get that person that, that, that can journey alongside of you. And like I said, no matter how skilled you think you are, I'm still learning every single day. And then just two other practical things. The one thing, I call it power dressing. And, um, you know, my, my colleagues at work, my girlfriends at work often laugh because they will say, we know you're going to have your hair done, your lipstick's going to be on, you're going to go shopping. But you know what? If you look good, you feel good. It's got to do with confidence. It's got to do about showing up, bring your cutlery, your chair, look good, know what you want, and, and seize the moment, you know. And it's something that no matter how... I once read a book about putting on your lipstick and putting on your eyes, um, high heels. I don't wear high heels anymore. I'm too old. I fall all the time now. But the power in putting on the lipstick, and, and it's just, you know, it could be seen as a, as a negative, but it's really, really a great strategy. And the last thing that I want to say, and I wrote it down because I didn't want to forget it, but it's about you are not always going to change the feelings of discrimination, not being heard, not being valued, and being undermined. And men have become powerful in terms of, you know, derailing us through some of those strategies. And so I want to say, don't get caught up there. Don't get caught up in today. I was, I felt like I was undermined. I mean, I was called Charlinky for a very long time. And, and, and um, you know, just don't get caught up there. Move beyond that. Find the space within yourself. And when you talk about owning your own voice, you know you, what your strengths are. You know what your areas of comfort are. And when you pitch up with your own cut and your own chair, read, research, um, talk to people. Come so well prepared. I mean, I, I recently walked into a meeting. Um, I, I can't say who was now. But I had two male colleagues with me. Um, and, and I considered myself to have more knowledge that they had. But we met with four other men. And at no point did anybody make eye contact with me or speak to me. And I allowed the conversation to go because I could see that, they, that the two men that were with me were going to get to a point where they were not going to be able to answer. And that's when I kicked in and I took over the meeting and I threw the balance out completely. But you know that, that sometimes we need to listen and sometimes we need to learn and sometimes we need to watch the space and know when it's best for us to do that. And that is some of the strategies which I've employed over the years to be able to know when is the right time to trust my voice and to have a voice and to get people to listen to me. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Charlene. That's, yeah, I've written all of those down. <laughs> As I can... <laughs> um, Nadine, you wanted to say something? Yes, yeah, so there was a, I think there was a, a question from um, Facebook uh, where someone said, my daughter holds a view that when women do the bidding of patriarchy in the workplace at the workplace at the expense of other women, there's a special place in hell for them. Um, <laughs> and I thought that was quite funny, but I think one of, I think, you know, I've shared some of those disappointments with, um, you know, older women, senior women, um, that you think are going to take you under their wing and mentor you and so forth, and it doesn't happen. Um, I've been very privileged to have a mother that I think has, has led in her time. But one thing that I've also come to understand is that for that generation of women that just came before me, those that are in their 50s and their 60s, they had to fight like tooth and nail. And they actually became part of the very system that they wanted to resist. Mm -hmm. So I feel a lot of sadness, actually, and, and, and empathy for them in a way. Um, but I'm certainly, it's, it's a reminder to me not to follow, not to follow that route. Um, and to create a more open and a more caring and a more nurturing uh, institutional space um, that helps to, to grow those women that come behind me who are possibly, probably, in fact, probably are much more gifted than I even am. Um, so I think, I think that's really important. I think the, the one thing that I, that I, I learned from my mother is that we, we build on the resilience of our foremothers. And Zande, you, you started that off acknowledging um, the resilience of your mother and your grandmother and the role that they played in your story 
And my mother and I um, had this conversation last year. We were saying to my mother, you know, you know, you've already done all this, this leadership stuff. Why am I still, um, you know, I'm 43 years old. It's 26 years after democracy. Why am I still facing the same challenges you faced back in the 70s and the 80s and the, you know, the early 90s? And, um, and I said to him, Mommy, when is this patriarchy <laughs> and oppression, uh, racism going to end? And, you know, she says to me, she said, ah, she says, ah, our mothers have been resisting for generations. And sure. we build on that and we keep going. And I was like, wow. Okay, yeah. Come on. We build on that and we keep going. Thank you, Nadine. Sandy, did you want to add something to that? I think just a short um, uh, comment for me was um, what Nadine said before about um, um, women having to support each other and and working uh, with each other and having older women that are able to support you in the journey that you are that you are taking. I think um, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out probably what could have changed because as uh, women of color, this is how we grew up in the communities that we're coming from, that we knew for sure that it is not only the person that is not that is your mother is not only your mother, but your aunt, the mother in next door, the mother in the row where you stay in is still your mother. And there were things that you were not able to do because for sure is in your mother's age that you were not able to do. And 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 in the communities that and 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 where I come from, and it has always been like that, where you knew for sure that from an elderly person you will get wisdom, whether that person is close to you or not close to you. And and uh, I think the more um, time changes, and in this generation, and now things have changed completely, and we are each other's. Um, enemies. I, I'm trying to make sure that wherever you are, you are not going to get to the level that is higher than where you should. You know what I mean? We, we, I, I, and and I, and I, I think personally for me, I have found it difficult to be able to deal with it because um, as a as a person, I am very much open and trusting. I take people i i'm i'm just a lover of human beings and i am i have been born with such a gift that i i trust you when i see you until probably you prove you prove to me that you are not trustworthy so i have been uh, in 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 difficult moments because of how i have dealt with people around me thinking that everyone that is around me will be able to support me will be able to build me up because that's the kind of a person that i am i have always taught everyone at church and even where i am right now i continue to say to my personal assistant in the years to come, I want to see you in this seat where I am and doing much greater than what I'm doing today. And every time she sees herself small and she doesn't think that she would get there. And my very first, first job in the nonprofit, I was a personal assistant. And, and I continue to tell her this story that this has been my journey. I am now going to get into my 50s um, because I've started to work earlier, but my journey has been from the ground um, level. You know what I mean? I haven't, I haven't had an opportunity of just growing up and having had uh, being a director or as, uh, as an executive. I had to gradually grow up. So I, I, I am not sure exactly what is the screw that came off out of us as women. So that, because I think we are stronger when we do this, what we're doing right now, the strength comes from knowing that there is a Shalim, there is a Nadine, there is a Claire that is clapping for me when I'm sitting in Nyanga and when I'm having difficulties and challenges. Come on. With the, 
with, the, with all of those challenges and the cultural challenges and the patriarchy in Nyanga. There are women that I can just call or WhatsApp and saying to them, I am struggling. How did you manage to be able to do this? And I don't know why it has been difficult. Lately, I have been thinking that I, I am longing and yearning to find spaces where women in leadership, even if it's directors of the organizations like the organization that I'm in, that could be able to sit and share ideas and our difficulties and the struggles that we go through. And it is difficult because people are so internal closed as if you're going to take something from them when they give you their wisdom and advice. So um, I can talk about this um, you know, forever, because it has been my experience and it is my frustration because I really feel that this time more than ever, we need each other, especially women. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank Thanks. You. And I think a lot of support from the chat. I see uh, Renee, hi Renee, has said um, that there's always a strong recognition for support or sisterhood or network of women. So she's asking, how can we set this up practically as an outflow of this discussion? Um, mm -hmm. we, we know that these networks are necessary. So let's just do it. Let's create mm -hmm. these spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Taryn, um, keep a note. <laughs> yes, I was going <laughs> to. Even for the people on, who are particip participating in this discussion as a starting point, let's, let's do this. Um, mm -hmm. I think from my side, I just want to echo, I mean, this, this idea of a support network and how crucially important it is, even in my experience. I mean, my work in, in most, well, my work is not easy. And I may look like I'm being hardcore in a particular meeting, but there are many days when I walk out of that meeting and I go to my car and I cry because it was actually so difficult to kind of hold that particular space. And without the support of, I have a WhatsApp group of friends and um, colleagues who, whom I can speak to about these things. I have a partner whom I can check in with. Um, I have people who remind me that I'm not crazy. It's not me, it's them. <laughs> um, and that's actually, um, that what I'm doing is, is the right thing and that my, I contribute and I have value in that space, even though that space sometimes tells me, often tells me I don't. And so, um, you know, I think this network is, is such an important thing for any woman um, in, in a position of leadership or in a social change role to have, and that certainly resonates very powerfully with, with my own experience. And I think, I think, Claire, I mean, in just response to Rene, I think for uh, often we wait for networks, we wait for forums. I say start it wherever you are, in the spaces that you're in, whether it's in your group, your pre-group in Yanga, or in your office. I see a lot of comments on my WhatsApp and Facebook deeply emotional, so emotional, wow, wow, wow. And it's basically women crying out for a sisterhood where they can unmask, unfilter, where they can admit, like Claire said, and um, reminded earlier what Charlene said too, that at the boardroom, we are strong and we hold our pose. But when we step out and we get into the car or when we get at home, we actually do cry because we still are women. And so to find those spaces where we can be naked and say, Today was damn tough. I have another. I have another question. I have another comment, um, and I like this. It, it responds to what Charlene said. Um, men who are allies have a strong role in educating other men, and not displacing or mansplaining women. And again, I think we want to echo that we were in an interview yesterday about today's webinar that we're not saying that we're throwing men out um, on the wayside or we're bashing them. We believe that they belong in this ecosystem because these men are our sons, they are our brothers and uncles. And so we need to find a space where, where all these voices are heard, but the, that the voices of women are not um, misplaced or ignored. 
Yeah, we've got another another comment. Um, this is tagging deeply at my heartstrings. I'm finding it interesting, actually, this 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 deeply emotional response. And I think you're right, Karen. I think it speaks to a real um, need for us to recognize um, our shared struggle um, and, and the kind of support we need in that struggle. I think we do work often in isolation, in isolation and anyone working in isolation, um, you know, is, is not as effective or strong as they, as they could be. And in fact, um, it, it does a disservice not only to ourselves, but, but to the work that we do. So I think this emotional response actually speaks to a very deep need uh, for this kind of, of community. It also shows us that our, we, our work's not done, it's, it's only just begun. Um, and I think something that Shalina said earlier, but all of this, um, amidst the, the, our spaces in leadership in academia, we still are mothers. Many of us are single mothers. And so we bear this burden on our back, um, still having to come home to our children. We often leave to, to serve other people. Nadine, you wanted to say something and then Shalene. No, I think the whole, um, one of the things that um, a colleague friend and I do is that we travel together to Stellenbosch. We don't live in Stellenbosch. Um, I live in Retreat, by the way, so hello from the Republic of Retreat. Um, and so we travel together and we were actually saying that during the pandemic, we've missed that traveling. I don't miss the drive. Let's just be clear on that. <laughs> but I, we really miss the debrief the caucus, the strategizing, the laughing, and Claire, you spoke about, you know, the whole thing. It, in these, often in this context, there's a lot of gaslighting. Um, there's a lot of microaggressions that you experience as a woman, person of color. Um, you know, that's difficult to explain. And sometimes you think, I'm crazy. Remember, am I crazy? Did that person just uh, put me down in a, you know, in an underhanded way. Was the person not just racist? And I think, Shani, what you were saying about knowing, having the wisdom also to know when to call out, how to call out, what space, um, and when I'm depleted, I realize that I will just straight out call you out, boom, which may not always be the wisest thing because I'm drained, because I'm dealing with my family situation, my work is stressful and now I'm sitting in a meeting with you and you're actually being racist to my face. So, or sexist or whatever, one of the exists to my face. So, um, yeah, just, I've got a bit off point, but just the point of being able to debrief. Um, and yeah, the role of one's spouse or family, the whole thing of family support systems. Um, one of the things my husband and I did was move back. This is a home that I grew up in, wasn't so big, but we built on, but but move back in with my parents so that I could have the support. Um, and even though my parents were still working at this time, you know, my mother, my mother said, your grandmother supported me when you were a child so that I could work full time and be that corporate mother. And so my parents were dropping and fetching. I couldn't do it without them. And I think in terms of community um, support structures, those are also aunties. <laughs> Those are neighbors in the communities, not only uh, mothers and, and, and grannies. We couldn't do it without that, using a biblical phrase, cloud of witnesses um, standing, standing behind us. So this whole, this whole notion of the superwoman, I think in my mother's time, I don't think it exists uh, without the, the village. Thank you, Nadine. Charlene, you wanted to make a, a comment? Just very quickly, I mean, I think we're running out of time, but I think one of the other things that have come out for me was the fact that we are mothers and that we have had mothers and that we have a role to play. And I found, um, and just because time, I'm not going to go into all of the details around that, but one of the things that I want to share is that um, during COVID, we, we've all found ourselves working from home. And I guess many of our children have, in, have had insights and are having insights in terms of our day-to-day -day reality. Now, if you're a mom like me, um, I talk all the time. Um, I, I said to my husband last night, you better listen to me on Facebook on live today. And he said, no, but you live all the time. I don't have to listen to you on Facebook live. 
So I'm the kind of mom that speaks nonstop. And for my sins, I have three children, 23, 21, and 14, and they all speak as much as I do. So often my husband hides in a corner because we're talking all the time. But I've recognized and I've realized that how I project myself as a woman in leadership and how that impacts, and I'm specifically speaking about my two daughters, and how that impacts them. And so I think that we have a, we have a bigger role to play um, you know, as mothers. Um, and if we have mothers like Zandi and Nadine shared and, and like I have, who are still an integral part of our lives and whom we have learned from, in our role, and sometimes we need to extend that, um, you know, to the children in our community, the children, I find it extremely privileged to work at a university. My own kids get upset when it's Mother's Day, and I'm getting gifts from students because they say, don't those kids have their own mothers? Mm -hmm. But I think it's such a privilege, um, you know, to be able to, I always say first and foremost, I'm a mother before I'm any, anything else. But understanding that role and that responsibility that we have and what we can learn from our own children. I've often learned some of the best lessons from my 14-year-old daughter. And, and, and so I just want to say that that's an important piece of this conversation. Um, that as mothers, we have a, a great role to play in terms of leadership and development. Thank you, Charlene. Um, Sandy, I don't know if you have any final comments and then we're just going to, to close. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for me, uh, my final uh, comment would be what I have seen and experienced in the, um, with women um, in the community, especially during this time of COVID-19. Um, I have experienced um, so much and I have learned so much from them. One of the women was, was telling us a story and saying to us that when they um, realized the situation, because COVID-19 has brought, has, has probably deepened um, our pre-existing inequalities and, and employment and everything that has been happening around us. And, and because of that, um, because of everything that has happened with COVID-19, people lost jobs and everything that has been happening. And this old lady is saying to me what they have done in the street was that she took these old, these women, um, old and young women, every day they were able to sit and share what is it that you have in your house? And if you have in your house a milli meal and I have potatoes and you have onions and they will be able to make this big pot of food that will be able to take care of their, of, of their families. And for me, I thought that was, you, you know, that was, I, I don't have a word um, for it that people would be able, when we get to this, crisis um, as, as the pandemic that will be able to think like that. So there is as, as bad as COVID-19 has been, but our humanity in a way has, has come back because we have been able to see outside of your own home and of your own comfort and see how you then able to, to take care of others. And some women have been able to think outside of the box. Some of them have been working for years in one place. And when they lost the jobs, they needed to think, how do I then continue to take care of my family? And some of them, they have opened these places where they sell, they cook and sell food to other people. And, and now they have, they are business women and they have never thought that they will get to that point of being a business woman. So I'm, I'm sharing all of this because I've been, um, I've been very much, um, I've been very much excited and been very much um, shocked by what I have seen in the community and how the community chooses to deal with whatever comes at any given moment. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's, that's my last, that's my last comment. Yeah. Thank you, colleagues. It's been for me such a I thought it was just going to be another panel discussion huh? and then it turned into this, like for me, uh, like it's also deeply emotional and I think, uh, you know, so, so much learning to, to take away from, from the, this discussion. Um, so thank you incredibly much for your time and for your insights and I hope that uh, 
This is not the last time we do this, Karen. Um, Definitely so, not, yeah. Karen. Uh, yeah, I, thank you very much. I think that's mm. as, I can, as much as I can say. Thank you. Mm. Um, and I hand over to you, Karen. So so thank so thank you. I know I had an iron fist when I asked some of you to, to come and be part of it. Um, I was pulling Zandi by the by the cuff. Um, but I know why. I think today's voice was very prophetic um, for a time such as this. Um, it was deeply emotional. And and so on behalf of the community chest, I want to thank you all for being really very unfiltered, raw and naked as you tell your stories and as you encourage the women of, of, of South Africa. Um, so I'm going to close in, in, in a piece, if you don't mind. Um, I start, I ask, was there ever a time when women were not in crisis? I answer, was there ever a time when women has not stepped up and proved themselves to be resilient and overcomers? God's creation Women, I know often we feel embittered and tired at times. Our backs heavy with this ongoing patriarchy and power that they use. Our skirts at the boardroom, but our voices so silent, bullied violently, our intelligence undermined. Our heads soar as we carry, carry this bucket, the bucket that feeds our streets, and the world. And then our children, who we often ignore, will wait for us at home as we lead spaces. The road of injustice, it remains long, painful, and never ending. And though many of them scorn our plight, our fight, and they overshadow our, our sight for a better South Africa for the children and our women. Do not forget the words, like Nadine said, the words of your grandmother, the words of your mother, our Googles and our aunts. It does not only have faith in God, but in ourselves and in the people ultimately that we serve. Our ability to fly and yet to rise in the times of crisis, COVID-19, the death of many women this year, hopelessness and despair. Let our faith and hope for a better and safer life for every South African woman and child, not next year, but today, tomorrow. Let us continue to stand in solidarity, holding each other's backs, the heaviness that we bear. As we continue to be the breast, the milk, and the hip, and the nourishment of this country. Let us continue to stand and if all else fails, let us continue to stand together as one, not forgetting to wear your lip gloss, your high heels, either in a skirt or in a pants. God bless everyone and thank you so much for today. <laughs>